if you're happy doing what you're doing, then nobody can tell you you're not successful. Yeah. Right. No. Mm. He's good at, like, telling you to take care of yourself. I met him at, like, a dinner thing a few years ago, and then I went to a couple of Stone shows. I started, I did, like, three weeks at the end of February and then stopped for about five months and then came back to it <clears throat> in July and then kind of uh, did it until kind of now-ish. I, I finished writing in like December and it gave me a chance to kind of completely step away from it and have a real break. And then also by the end of the movie because we were swimming so much, and he'd be like, yeah. And then he'd go, do you want to hear everyone else's first single. I was like, yeah. I like the writing part the most. I think everyone reacts differently to like different types of music. And then really, I think I just, I don't know. And we just wanted to make like what we wanted to listen to. At the moment, I mean, in the least weird way possible, it's like my favorite album to listen to at the moment. Like I love listening to it. You know, if nothing happens with it, I love it. So I think I think that's kind of what you should do. Making all the changes and it's been it's been fun to kind of like watch over it all. Um I mean I hope we we did it a good job, but um I'm up very early. I think it was just hot. Um, I mean, I'm always interested to kind of see what's what's happening, but I'm very lucky, um, and I don't, I don't know, not not really. It was uh, it was a little more of an emergency step in. And, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about it, actually. I can cook a bit, yeah. I can veg, like a nut roast. Uh, I was going to wear this robe and, uh, it's been, uh, it's been, yeah. Um, I think it's about like, you know, over the last couple of years, I guess it's about like self-reflection and self-discovery and, and just like freedom. It feels like very free to me, which is, you know, um, I, I, I have no idea, but I'm blushing, I'm, you know, I think it's kind of everyone's dream a little bit, right? You kind of want to go at them as like a fun, creative thing rather than like, well, I don't want to be in the real world, so I'm going to take something. Um, a lot of the time, you end up kind of, as you're writing songs, you'll finish like a verse and be like, is this good? And you're like, well, you don't know. You, you, you know, you've just started it. But um, for me, a, a big part of it is just kind of getting out of my own head. Whenever I'm trying to write good music is usually when I write the worst music, or at least my least favorite music. Um, I, feel, I feel like sometimes, like, you'll write something and you'll either go is this good enough? Or you get like a chorus that you think is really good and then you're like scared of ruining it by writing like a bad verse or something. 
Mm. Yeah, I think it's kind of like, you know, if there's a song you don't like or something you don't like in your head, even if it's like a subconscious thing, you can kind of be like, yeah, well, that wasn't really my choice or that, that kind of thing. And then, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely putting obviously more of yourself out there. Um, but I kind of, that's kind of what's exciting. For me, a big part of it was like, when I first came out of the band, I think I kept thinking like, oh, I don't want to make fun music. And a lot of that was a subconscious thing. I just didn't really want to make like the same, I just didn't want to make the same music that we're making in the band. Not because I didn't like it. I just didn't want, I just didn't, I just wanted it to be a different thing. Um, I mean, I feel like, I feel like it's not, uh, you know, and a lot of people, obviously, there's a lot of, like, arguments with people like, oh, I hate my label, and, uh, everything's, the anything that goes wrong is, like, their fault and that kind of thing, and I have to say, like, um, Rob, who kind of runs my label, uh, he signed me, and he signed us in the band as well, so I, I've been with them for a while, but when I signed um, on my own, I kind of said, I called him and just said, like, I kind of need to go and, like, figure this out a little bit, and I don't want, I really, I'm not going to be able to do it if you're, like, breathing down my neck, basically, and, um, hmm. and he was amazing about it, he just said, like, I want to hear it when you're excited to play it to me. And when you're ready, I'll hear it. So, mm. he came when the album was basically finished, and I think he was shitting himself quite a bit. And uh, he said the first like four songs, he felt like he was drowning. Cause he just didn't know, you know, he didn't know what he was expecting. Mm. It was because I'd never really played her stuff before. Um, and she was in London, there were some Fleetwood Mac shows in London, and uh, she wakes up pretty late, and she wanted to go to dinner one of the nights, so I took her to this little Indian restaurant near my house, um, and then, and then she said, oh, I want to come hear the album, and she was with like all her ladies, and I played them the album, and they're so used to like living nocturnally. They, you know, they wake up really late and then they kind of live through the night because they're, you know, witches. 3 a.m. playing the <laughs> playing the album. I'm like, I'm kind of tired. And they're like right in their prime. You know, they're really like, oh, this is like daytime for us. I'm exhausted. Well. I think the thing is, is obviously you hope she doesn't say that, but the the biggest kind of advice she's always given me is to just do what I want to do. So there was a couple of bits where like she thought the first single was wrong and she thought a song that didn't go on the album should have gone on the album. Hmm. Uh, I, I definitely thought about it. Um... But, yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like the whole point is to just do. Okay, well, if I wanted it this way, and then she told me to change it, and I didn't, I must really want it this way. When I start asking too many people, it's usually because I don't want to do it, and I'm waiting for somebody to tell me not to do it. So I had, I basically had like three songs that I was thinking about doing. And uh, I went in the bathroom in my house. I was living with my mom and my sister. And I made them stand on the other side of the door of the bathroom. So I sang the three songs. I was like, which one do you think I should do? And then they said that one. So I, I did Isn't She Lovely through all of the like earlier um, auditions before you get on the TV show. 
Um, so we did like a Battle of the Bands competition. Ten hours of studio time or something. One of them is still doing the band. Um, and then one guy moved to, he went to Italy. Hmm. Um, I'm in touch with, I speak to one of them a little bit, and I, I've spoken to another one kind of um, recently-ish, but not, not super recently, and then kind of lost touch with the other one. It was called Winter. Uh, hmm. I think a big part of it is what you want to get from it. I think if you're looking for... If you're looking for, like, fulfillment in music and you want to, like, take songs and be, like, a massive pop star and just have people write songs for you and sing them, then you'd think the goal is so that it's more successful. So then then I just think you're measuring yourself on, like, the being successful part of, of music, which which is fine and it's amazing and it works for a lot of people. I, I don't know... But then that's the only thing you're ever measuring it by. I feel like, I mean, to be fair, they did know better than us. Because, like, when we started, I was 16. Um, it, everything was so new and exciting. And you're suddenly working with these big producers and big people and, like, I never would have been confident enough to be like, actually, guys, I'm going to write a song on this first album. So it was basically like the first album was pretty much done, kind of, you know, writers and stuff. Okay, we're going to do this song, and these guys have written this song, what do you think, and that kind of thing. It was all... It was all new, and I had no idea. I didn't... I didn't go on the show thinking I was going to win. I didn't, my mum actually entered me in to go, and um, and we, we used to watch it as a family, and we were watching it one time, and somebody finished a performance, and I just said like, oh, it looks like so much fun, and then I went upstairs, and then a couple months later, my mum was like, oh, you have an audition on Sunday. Um, I was, I was okay. I was a little scared. But it was the first round of auditions was at Old Trafford, which is where Man United play, and I was a massive Man United fan, so I was like, oh. It's kind of, uh, yeah, it was. It it's kind of like one of those just out of body things, because it was so it's so so far out of my comfort zone. Like all I did was school, and I worked in a bakery after school. Um, I was okay. No, not really. It's kind of one of those where, like, I had dinner recently with this girl that I went to school with and uh, a couple of friends, and one of them was my manager was there. And they met, and, and he was like, was he, was he the same in school? And she was like, yes and no. You know, it's similar in a lot of ways and not very similar at all in some ways. I had a little more uh, timber on me back then as well. I was working in a in a bakery. Yeah, it wasn't great for the. Also, like when you're kind of 14, 15, you get you got that bit of like puppy fat going on too. Um. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Uh, he was like the guy when we were on the show like when we were on the show on X Factor everybody was like that guy is so fucking good like his voice was amazing he's a great he's just like a very talented musician I think about it all the time and and it kind of I guess just reminds me how lucky I am to be doing it because I know there's you know hundreds of thousands if not millions of musicians who are so far superior to me as a musician um, and not everyone gets to do it it's like one of those things where I do think a lot of this stuff is about luck and I do think I do believe like some people make their own luck but I also think 
so much of it is just about luck and timing because when I look at it, there's no reason. There's no reason for it to have been me who got to do this. For, I mean, yes, talking to him is so fulfilling for so many reasons. Obviously, he's one of the greatest songwriters of all time. Um, and has just, like, been through, you'd imagine, pretty much everything in terms of what that all kind of entails. And and also, he's, he's so... It's kind of what I was saying earlier, like, if you're somebody who's just taking the big songs to try and have a hit, at some point you don't have a hit, and then how do you feel when you don't kind of hit that? And he's someone who clearly just loves music and has never lost kind of gaining something from making albums and writing songs and stuff. And I went to watch him at the O2 um, last December, and... Uh, Like, he plays for three hours. And you're like, he doesn't have to play for three hours. He clearly just loves it. You look at kind of all, like, the rockers and all those older guys. You're like, who ultimately do you want to be at the end of the day? Do you, you don't want to be the guy who died. You don't want to be the guy who's, like, whacked out on drugs. You want to be the guy who's, you know, 70 and playing for three hours because he can and because he wants to. And everyone's loving it. And he's having fun. Yeah, I find it super inspiring, that show, actually. He's, he's, you know, he's incredible. Hmm. Right. Mm hmm New York's just, like, a little much for me. I run in New York, which I like. It actually has made me enjoy the city a lot more. Um... I mean, I think it's one of those things because, uh, you know, every two people you speak to, one of them says it's really scary and the other person says it's not that scary. Um, I think it's, like, about... I mean, I don't know. It's 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 one of those things where, like, it's kind of like the simple stuff. You, like, wash your hands all the time and don't... You know, I, I, I don't really know. It's kind of one of those things where, like... The traveling thing is hard. You don't really know how it's going to affect that stuff. But then, but then the touring's like not the most important thing. Somebody texted me these pages from the Eyes of Darkness, and it's basically like predicting the whole thing. It's crazy. Yeah. It says that like uh, around 2020, a pneumonia-like virus will sweep through the world. Uh, there'll be no. There'll be no, um, like, known treatment. It will come back ten years later and then disappear. And in the book, the, the name of the strain is called Wuhan 400. You know. Um, there's this girl, Madison Cunningham. Um, she's amazing. Uh, she's going to come. Actually, we're playing a show at Madison Square Garden for Halloween. She's going to come uh, play with us there. Um, she's great. She's really cool. No, I had like a, my, a hood up and a big jacket on, a hat on and everything. It was pretty cold. And um, and I turned my music off because I was listening to some music. And uh, I'm walking up and I kind of see this group of this group of guys. They've all got like hoods up and their faces covered and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's a bit weird. And I'm walking up the street, and uh, and I keep kind of turning around, and the guys cross the road, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's weird. Yeah. And uh, and then I'm walking up, and I hear like there was like gravel on the pavement, so I hear like shuffling of feet, trying to like catch up to me. So I cross the street, and then they cross the street, and I'm like, oh fuck's sake. And then I'm walking up, and I hear, like, there was, like, gravel on the pavement, so I hear, like, shuffling of feet, trying to, like, catch up to me. So I cross the street, and then I cross the street again, and then they cross the street again, and I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, I think I'm about to get robbed. So, um, so the guy's like, hey, can we talk to you for a minute? And there's nobody around, so I'm like, um, so I'm like, sure. 
And uh, he's like, do you smoke weed? And I said, no. And he goes, do you want some weed? And I thought, no. Um, and then he was like, what have you got on you? And they all kind of gathered around me. Um, and this was a li- something I've been a little bit pissed off about is because uh, I've filed a police report, so then obviously it goes in the press and everything. And they wrote that there was only one guy, so I'd like to clarify there was more than one guy. So, um, so he's like, what have you got on you? And I'm like, I don't have anything. And, uh, you know, they say stop fucking around and that kind of thing. So I have some cash in my pocket. So I said, I've got some cash. So I pull out some cash. He takes it from me. And then uh, I had, like, my headphone jack. It's just sticking into my pocket. And he was like, what's that plugged into? I'm like, oh, God's sake, it's my phone. Uh, And I'm thinking... Okay, this is really annoying, but, you know, I'll wipe it and get a new phone and whatever. And then uh, the guy's like, okay, unlock your phone. And uh, the other one, like, pulls his shirt up and he's got, like, a knife sticking in his in his pants. And um, I was like, shit. And I, I'm kind of thinking, like, do I get... I just said, like... I can't. Like, I'm sorry. I, I was like, mate, I, I can't. I'm not my phone. And then the guy's like, you've got 10 seconds to unlock your phone. He starts counting down. And I'm like, fuck, am I going to unlock my phone? Am I going to give him my phone? What's the deal? So then I try and give him my phone. And he's like, no, I need to unlock it. And I was like, I can't. And then there's a little pond behind me near where I live. And I, I thought about throwing it in the pond to just be like... And the lights changed, and there was, like, two cars coming. And I just, like, felt an opportunity, and I just sprinted, ran. Well, I ran into the road, and I tried to stop a car. And obviously, a madman runs into the road, tries to get in your car. You're not going to let him in. Uh, Try and get in another car. Don't let me in. But now I'm slightly away from them, because I'm in the street. And I think, like, I just burned, just turned down and ran back towards, like, the little village area near where I live. So I just kind of sprinted, but usually when I'm out walking, I'm wearing, like, running stuff. And this was the one night I'm wearing, like, corduroy flares and shoes. Uh, yeah, I just sprinted down down the thing, and, and I guess because they had some cash and stuff, they just ended up turning around. I mean, I went walking again the next day right. because for that exact reason, I just didn't want it to stop me walking. Like, I walk a lot of nights uh, when I'm home, and I really like it. I feel like it's, you know, something I just really enjoy. And uh, so, so I went, and actually I had some friends with me the next time. But I've been going since, and I have like a, I have someone, I have like a night guard who comes to my house. Um, it's, it's weird, it's uncomfortable, I think. It's really weird, and a lot of the time you end up drawing more attention to yourself if you're walking through a city with like some big guy behind you, you know. I feel like a, a big way that it's changed is that back then, I feel like everyone kind of just felt like really grateful to be getting to make music as a job and I feel like it's just a lot more competitive now it was more competitive about like writing songs um like it's like feels a little more like a business for a lot of people I feel like back then you wrote a song for one reason and then if it went number one that was like amazing and maybe I'm wrong because I you know wasn't alive so I could be completely wrong but it doesn't feel like People were going, let's change this chorus a bit because then it can be like a number one. Obviously, it's changed a lot because of like streaming and everything like that. I think uh, a lot of the time now, like if you, I guess back then, if you loved someone's show or their music, you might go to the show and hang out and stuff. And now, I guess there's there's just a lot of people like that feel involved a lot of the time. So. 
if you're like, oh, I really like this song, then suddenly people are like, well, you guys should collaborate and get in the studio together. And, and it becomes, sometimes, it becomes like, it's not like an organic hangout. It becomes your kind of, you know, people try and like put you together. So when it happens and it's like organic and you run into people and you get on and end up hanging out and if you play music or not, most of the time you probably don't. It's really nice. Um, I think like if there's stuff that I really want to do and it kind of sounds like like I just really want to be involved in it, then I'd love to do it. I don't I don't see myself like wanting to go get a movie because I have like a year off and I want something to do. But if you know when when I heard about Dunkirk, it was like when I, I got it, they said, you know, don't take anything because we don't want it to be like actory. But I mean, it was good, I guess, because the character was like a young soldier who didn't know what he was doing. It was kind of one of those things where like I learnt the script, I learnt what my lines were, but I never practiced them. I didn't like say them out loud. Yeah, I think someone had told me, like, just say the words as if it's the first time you're saying them. And I was like, I'm just going to make it the first time I'm saying them. I mean, I think you want to be, like, comfortable enough in case they make changes and stuff. I think a lot of the time when people, like, go over and over and over lines is you get stuck one way of saying stuff and you don't really know how to change it. So I kind of just tried to go at it as, like... It was also just the size of the set. And I was a massive fan of Chris Nolan before. So the whole thing was really intimidating. Like the first day on set, walk out and there's like some destroyer marine ship in the water. And I was like, is that for us? And they're like, yes. And I was like, oh shit. It was really fun. Yeah. The thing with SNL was, I feel like I used to get so nervous before everything, before we do anything, and uh, to the point where like I used to be so nervous that I'd just, I'd almost always just be really disappointed with something because I just thought I was too nervous or my hand was shaking or something like that. And uh, SNL, I don't really know why. I think maybe just because so much of the time you go on a show and you sit backstage for three hours for three minutes and you go out and it's like okay, every, you know you finish the album now you're selling the album let's go this is the three minutes don't mess it up here we go and SNL like you're there for the week you've rehearsed everything ultimately everything's written on the cards so like I mean they're all so amazing over there they're, they're pretty great my, my mom is like um very chilled about the whole thing uh, they just like get it I think it's, it's difficult because so many people kind of have that uh, you know they have like pushy parents and that kind of thing and they just kind of always stayed out of it um, you know th those people have like looked after you your entire life and still now and uh, you know especially with my mum like I wouldn't be here if she hadn't put me in for the thing and when I when I moved to London for the show, she lent me some money to, you know, go and buy a bunch of clothes and stuff. Um, ben Ben was making a documentary with the band. Um, I'd met him. Um, we'd met a couple times. Like, um, he tells the story of me asking to move in with him, and I I cannot believe that I would have the gall to ask him after all spending a couple of days with him. Um, so I'm pretty sure he offered, but I was moving. Um, I'd got a house in his area, like five minutes from his place, and I'd moved out of my last place. And I basically had like two weeks where I was, you know, going to do some painting and stuff in the house. Um, and the painting turned into like ripping the insides out. Um, so I moved in for a planned two weeks and I'd never met his wife we met for like coffee just so I'd met her and stuff and um, um, but uh, when I moved in they'd, they'd only just recently moved in um, 
There was nothing really in the attic, so I just kind of took my mattress from my flat and threw it on the floor in the attic. And I had that for about, it was like nine months, and then eventually I got a bed. But um, it was probably the best move I ever made, I think. Um, I had like, I'd moved away from my family. I had like some feeling of family. We never really talked about work, so I'd go and play like show in Brazil and come home and just sit and watch TV with them. Um, like I moved to London, you're kind of, I was in the band, we're traveling, and suddenly there's no rules. And even as simple as they, uh, they have like a kosher house. So I moved in, I didn't really get it. And the first week I ordered like a pepperoni pizza. Um, right at the time when I like started going out in London and drinking and you could go into bars and you know little members clubs and get hammered and then go home and I think so many of those parties in London there's like that there's like that 2am cut off where half the party goes upstairs to do cocaine and you know you're kind of like thrown into this thing and I'm and you know I'm kind of there and I'm like well I'm not gonna I don't know his wife well enough to go back, like, off my face, you know? Um, it, it, was, it was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. The biggest thing for me was probably when I moved to London and you start meeting all these new people and you meet other people in the industry and stuff. And the first thing I remember was, it's like, any dinner... I would go to or drinks thing um, like it's such a world of gossip as the world is but you know within the industry everybody loves to gossip and I just remember hearing so many stories about people being assholes and people like smashing shit and um, people throwing food and all of that shit and just people being weird to other people and I just remembered like how it made me think of the other of those people and I was like I really don't want anyone to tell a story like that about me you know mm. um I feel like I mean it, it's always kind of a a balanced thing, some of it, because you wanna you wanna date normally, but then you also wanna protect it so that it can be normal. Like I think a, a good example is like, you know, if you wanna go for dinner with someone, New York's pretty busy, and if you wanna have like a quiet dinner, you maybe wanna go like in the back door or something. But then that's not a normal date either, you know. Yeah, I think I think ultimately anyone who's gonna get it is gonna understand that because I think a big part of it is like you want to you want to be able to spend enough time with each other where you can get to know each other before you have to deal with all of the extra stuff and you're kind of like solid enough in what this is it's like okay you know how I feel about you I know how you feel about me um, we're gonna kind of we're already a relationship and then you add the stuff on the top rather than you go out for dinner with someone and it's like, oh, that's his, um, you know, that's his girlfriend or whatever. And you're like, well, it's not. And now it's weird because we're like, are we dating or are we not dating? Like, I, I try as hard as I can to keep the two worlds kind of, you know would like to do yeah you know open and um people have different like things but yeah I, i'd like to think i would want that sort of point, yeah. um no I, I, i'm pretty lucky with them like i can't you know think i i feel like when you grow up and you understand a little more about relationships even then you kind of you know you you get it when you know about your parents getting divorced but ultimately I think whether they want to be together or not all you can really ask for is them to like support you and love you and I've always had that from both my parents 
Well, I got up this morning at 5.30. Um, you know, all, I mean, I, you won't find me in bed past the crack of noon. No. A lot of the time, yeah. Yeah. And I was like, nah. It felt so annoying. Like, people, like, friends, phone numbers and stuff. Um, yeah, a lot of voice notes. We, we recorded a lot of the new album at um, Real World, which is Peter Gabriel's studio in, in England. Um, but we all got in there and we just wanted to blast Sledgehammer in the room so bad. And we were like, do you mind if we do it? We kind of, I do a lot of writing with Mitch. Uh, we met during the first album. Um, this guy Ryan, who was engineering, um, was Mitch's roommate. And we had a guitarist who was supposed to come in. And Ryan was like, I can get Mitch to come in. So Mitch came in. And uh, he was just playing. We were writing together. And it was kind of like, uh, so we met, yeah, 2010. And then he was working kind of always. And we had a band while we were in, while we were in One Direction. And I was like, what are you doing next year? He said, nothing. And I was like, great. I don't, I don't know if I could say it's something he shouldn't have done because I, I just didn't feel that way. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to like condemn it because I don't. The last thing that I would have wanted is for him to have stayed there if he didn't want to be there. If he'd come to us and maybe kind of discussed it a little more, we might have found a way to kind of do it a little smoother, but... But ultimately, if you know, if you don't want to be there, then you don't want to be there, and like you know. Um, I think like I'd I'd been in the band since I was 16, and you know there was five of us, and then we had like a lot of managers, and we had a lot of people at the label, and. You kind of you're you're in these meetings and it's like, are we going to do another album? Yes, are we going to do another tour? Yes, are we going to do this, that, and that. And every and all of those decisions obviously affect your life in a massive way. And every decision I've made since I was 16 was as part of a group. And I kind of just felt like I needed to work out. I didn't necessarily know who I was as an adult. It was like I had to go off and. If somebody says, do you want to go do this? And I'm like, what do we think? It's a little difficult, I guess, when, when like, I think if you're just starting out fresh, you, you have the ability to, like, make a ton of mistakes and stuff. Right. Like, for example, if you're an actor who's just starting out, you can make a ton of bad movies, and then, uh, and then you make, like, your great movie and stuff. And I kind of... I definitely felt a little bit of like I'm trying to work out what exactly my solo music sounds like who I am a bit and uh, and I don't really want to like start fucking it up kind of in front of people um, Sarah John well it's really it's Sarah's band because it's, after every show it's either the first or second thing that people say the show was great drummer's incredible uh, so Mitch starts going out with them and every night they'd tell me like oh Mitch was crazy last night what did Mitch do last night and they were like oh no we didn't see him and then when we started rehearsing together he would play and then over the weeks he would kind of just staring at each other the whole time we would play. Yeah. Uh, initial stages of infatuation with somebody. But, I mean, the common denominator would be me. Uh, 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 I, well, I think Adore is more about, like, it's more about that honeymoon period than the other part. I like uh, 
like I think I think it's kind of like any relationship you know once you get past that stage then the exciting part becomes that you're like a team I mean I can't say I've had like a lot of relationships like proper relationships but um, you know that that can be hard mm -hmm. I try and keep that the fame thing out of the relationship thing as much as possible well we call sometimes I thought about getting one in London and then because I live in London and for me it was like I had a bit of a hard time getting out of my own way enough to go to therapy in the first place and I felt like there was a big part of me that was like oh everybody like everybody I know is in therapy and I was like I just don't think I need it and I want to be the guy who didn't have to go to therapy and then somebody just described it to me as like you can tell somebody everything you can talk at somebody and then you pay them and they're not allowed to tell anyone yeah right it's much easier to have one person who is like a vessel who I can tell everything to and I feel like if if I started having two different people it would confuse me a bit no I think she um, I mean I think she's amazing she like definitely uh, mm. no no yeah. Uh, this was uh, I don't know, like a day. I mean, we have like they have like different suits and like different colors and stuff. And you know, we give a shit. Uh, the aforementioned mushrooms were in play. I jumped out a window. I was high. I don't know if I thought it would be cool. Um, I don't know. And uh, I hit my chin on my knee. And I bit like the end of my tongue off. No, it was pretty painful, but um, it's okay now. Like if I'm really tired, I can feel my mouth get lazy. And I get like a very small wrist. And it's gone. Yes. Weed makes me tired, and I don't like smoke. I don't feel like it's chosen as much as who I want to give a break. It's more like I have to hear it every night. Um, I feel like I feel like um, when I was a kid, there's you know you kind of dress. I mean you're in uniform, and then when you're around friends, there's so much like pressure wear the cool thing or have the right shoes and that kind of thing and I feel like I'm just like a lot more comfortable probably with myself now than I used to be and, and I think I didn't want to be a hypocrite and if there's something that seems fun and I want to try it on then um, I'll wear it don't really try not to I guess with like clothing and stuff I just try and not take it seriously it's not like it doesn't feel like performance it's kind of one of those things where um, you know you like people like oh we want you to be yourself and then you do that kind of stuff and people are like the whole like trying to please everyone thing just doesn't work or anything it's like a yeah it's just like a storage unit yeah okay ooh let me think uh, no I think we're good There's not a lot of, like, interviews where I talk a lot about, like, personal stuff. No. Yeah. So many of my close friends are here. People from London who've moved here for work and stuff like that. It's like, I'd say since I left home, I have, I've never really had the place that feels like, oh, that's, that's my home. I'd say my house in London is the most homely, um, that I feel anywhere, um, just because I've been there the longest. I've been there for like six years now. 
with like all the touring and stuff that we did in the band, I remember there was one point where we'd been away for so long that I came home to my house in England. And I was home for about five days. And I walked in the door and I sat down. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do like when I'm home at all. I'd been away for so long. Mm. I didn't, you know, I hadn't seen my friends for so long. I, was, I didn't know who was around. You know, it's not that far away from where I grew up. It's like a three hour drive. Mm. But London was like where the rich kids went shopping on the weekend. But also everything about it felt, felt like, it was like, this is a new challenge. And if it takes me to London, then there'll be times where people will remind me of stuff that happened that I forgot about. And you like relive it all over again. And you're kind of like, oh yeah, that was cool, that was cool too. You know, the first two years, you don't even feel like you're working at all. Um, and you kind of go from also like, you know when you're a kid and you like, you see a t-shirt that you want and you like save up the exact amount, but you'd have to account for like the postage and packaging. So you'd actually have to like save up for this amount. You know, you're kind of like doing this and then you move to London and you work doing stuff that's fun and you're like, can I buy this t-shirt? And someone's like, uh, yeah, if you want. Probably like a birthday meal I had with some friends. I used to live next to a Chinese restaurant. Um, <laughs> and it was like my favorite restaurant. <laughs> so I used to come home from school every day. I'd get up to my bedroom, like open the window and stick my head out. To smell like, it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you know? And uh, that was like where I went for my birthday meal. One of my favorite memories, I'll give you two. The first one was when we'd just been formed as a band, there was like a picture of us that had been taken from when we were at the show, like mm. someone's mum had taken it. And it was like the first picture of us as the five of us. And we were like living in this little bungalow, all of us together to like practice. And we were just like singing songs and basically just had a sleepover for like four days and everyone drove down. and. And there's a tiny little uh, like news agent down the street. And we'd heard this picture was being put in the paper. So we were like, oh, we're going to be in the paper. <laughs> like, that's crazy. So the five of us like, walk, like left this little bungalow and walked down to the news agents and got the paper and then came back and had breakfast. And we're all just like sitting, staring at the paper and like passing around the paper. And we're like, let me see it again, let me see it again. We were watching X Factor at, my family, we were at my cousin's house. You know, we watched it and we're like, oh my God, that's crazy. And then we're driving home and we go to a petrol station to stop off and fill up. And I'm in the petrol station and this guy goes, were you just on X Factor? And I was like, <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> we were in Sweden recording What Makes You Beautiful mm. in the studio. Someone came up into the room and was like, there's two girls outside. And we were like, why? And they're like, they're, they're like looking for you. And we were all just like, but we're in Sweden. <laughs> oh my God, that's so crazy. Like we're in Sweden. How, how, you know? I didn't really have a plan for like when I wanted to make a record. I knew I wanted to start writing at some point. I tried to write with as many different people as possible just to feel like, just to like learn. The best way I've ever heard songwriting described is like, it's kind of like surfing in that you can practice getting up on the board as much as you want, and sometimes the wave just doesn't come. Or the wave comes, but you haven't practiced getting up on the board enough. When I'd been writing in the band, it was kind of like, if I'd ever written stuff that, that was just with a friend or something, it was kind of like, well, I'm not gonna release any music, but what would it sound like if I was to write a song that was for me? Just didn't really want to. 
and um, definitely didn't have time to. I knew that, like, maybe one day I'd want to do it, but I wasn't like, I can't wait to get out of this thing so I can go and make my own record. There was a part of me where I felt like all of the decisions I'd made as an adult that affected my life and what I had, to, what I was doing with my life had been made as a group. Mm. And I think there was a part of me that felt like I wanted to make some decisions for myself, where it was like, I felt like I need to make some decisions that just affect me. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was, it was hard, you know? Part of it was, it was kind of like, we were sad, obviously, that someone had left, but also sad that he was so, he was not enjoying it so much that he had to leave. Because I think at the time, too, the tour and everything was going so well, and we were, everyone had kind of got to this place where everyone was kind of living in a way where everyone was kind of enjoying it. And, um, yeah, I'd say a big part of it was, was us kind of being like, wow, he didn't realize he wasn't enjoying it that much, you know? You know, obviously there was a big, there was big moments for us where we were like, what are we doing, you know? So we were about to start recording a new album and yeah. stuff, and it was like, are we just, are we recording this without him? And, but I'd say in the moment, I guess the, the four of us became closer. Mm. Um, because we were like, okay, this is a hurdle that we weren't expecting. And I think you deal with this in many different places when, when you're work with like traveling and touring, it, it, and it's a demanding thing and not everyone likes doing it. But it's kind of like if someone's not enjoying it, you'd rather they don't do it. I can also tell because the times where I've ever been like really, really upset by people, is when I'm more upset with myself when I've got it wrong. Because I feel like I have a really, I'm like, a, I feel like I'm a pretty good judge of character. And that's the only time I feel myself get really upset with stuff like that. Is where you're like, oh, I trust this person, or, you know, I, mm. I feel like they're a good thing, and then it goes the other way, and you're kind of like, ah, I got that wrong. I think for a long time I was like, I don't need that. You know, it's very like British way of looking at it, I think. And then I think there was a point where I kind of was trying to work out a lot more stuff about myself because obviously then I was, then it was just me working. On your own, yeah. Um, and I think it kind of comes with, when you're trying to make music, you're, it's so navel gazing, you're just like, like, the, making an album, I feel like, is the most self-indulgent time. I'm pretty lucky, actually, with, with that stuff because... And it's probably why I didn't go to therapy earlier, is because I have those friends where I'll have the same conversation that I would have with a therapist. I was at this talk thing where Alan de Botton was talking, and he was talking about how, like, Real friendship is just built on vulnerability. The second you open up to someone with like a real thing is when you actually get to know someone. So I definitely got, if there was someone that I was friends with and I felt like, oh, I want to be like close to them, just open up really kind of straight away. And doing that has definitely caused me to become much closer with like, just people, just my, all of my friends in general, I'd say. When I like listen to the first album now, I can hear all of the places where I feel like I was playing it safe because I just didn't want to get it wrong. But um, I guess a big part of going into this album was I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about the whole process of you make an album and then you put it out and you, you know, kind of release it and then you tour it. And all of the bits that I didn't enjoy as much, I kind of went into the second one feeling like 
I want to work out how to make all of this feel really fun. I was kind of trying to redefine what success meant to me. For so long, especially in the band, it was like every album got bigger and every tour got bigger, and it was like always growing. And I think when I went to make the first record, it was kind of freeing, because I felt like, well, I don't have to do this anymore. That was a thing that I'd always said I wanted to do when we kind of started, and when we started doing the music, it was like, I kind of said to my manager, like, the first tour that I do, I want it to be really small. I just wanted to have fun. If you're happy doing what you're doing, then nobody can tell you you're not successful. I mean, it's so obvious, but it's also the kind of thing where probably four years ago, if someone had said that to me, I'd be like, OK. Golden, we wrote on day two of being in Shangri-La. Well, he was in, uh, we were working in a studio in London, mm. and he was in, we were kind of trying to finish up, and he was in the studio next door. He came in at, well, I can't remember how it happened, but he kind of just ended up in there listening. We listened and we all like had fish and chips and talked and stuff and he's really, he's cool. I don't even know if we oh uh, yeah, maybe we played in that. But none of the none of that stuff was finished. I don't think they had horns on it yet. Lights up I don't think was written. Lights up adore you, treat people, and uh, yeah, those three I think were all hadn't been done yet. In all honesty, I'd say I try and think about it as little as possible because it's a very strange dynamic thing. Um, it's also like a weird thing to think of about yourself. Totally. Like, um, I guess the thing with like sex in general is like it used to feel so much more taboo for me to even like even like when we're in the band, like the thought of people thinking that I had sex was like, oh no, that's crazy. Like, what if they know? But it's like, you know? Come, even just like coming into this record, I, I wanted to feel a little less like guarded with stuff. I wanted to feel a lot freer and just more joyful and like honest. And I think a lot of the time with like, when there's like tabloid stuff, for example, of like people breaking up and, you know, it's like, I think people forget that there's like a person who's also broken up with someone which is sad. Yeah, and it's kind of like, it's a weird one for me because I'm always like, you know, I don't like to kind of explain songs or like kind of explain the meaning behind them and stuff like that. But I think with this record, it's so much more open. A thing that I like about kind of definitely where this record went, especially compared to the last one is like, when I start making an album, I don't feel like, oh, I'm making an album that I'm gonna put out in December of next year. Or it feels like I just start writing some songs and then, so then I can be as honest as possible. And then the time when you get to decide if you think it's too honest is when you're putting it out. And I never wanna like trim that stuff down. I felt like I was realizing some stuff about, it was all part of like being more open and, you know, not being like, I don't care. It's like, no, like you get petty when, you know, when it's, when something's not going the way that you want. Like you get petty with that stuff. And I think there's something with Cherry where it's like, it's so pathetic kind of in a way. The night that, I wrote it. We'd been writing for a few weeks and everyone had uh, left the studio. It was me, uh, Tyler and Sammy, who's our engineer. And we were kind of sitting around talking at like 2 a.m. maybe. And I was saying that I was feeling a lot of pressure because the last record wasn't like a radio record. 
I felt like a lot of pressure to be making these like big songs. And I was like, I feel like it, this record has to be really big. So I feel like I need to make certain songs. You know, I have all these ideas about records that I want to make, and I want to make this record in five years, and I want to make this record in 10 years, and I want to make, like, just these ideas for records that I want to make. And we had this conversation, and Tyler just said to me, you just have to make the record that you want to make right now. That's it. There's no, like, let me make sure this one's a commercial success so that I can make what I want later down the road. Um, so then we stayed up and wrote Cherry that night. So, I don't know, I think it was like, cause it got added in later on and it felt so part of the song. It just felt like it needed it. We're friends and stuff, so I asked her if it was okay and she was okay with it. I think she liked it. I was going out for dinner, I think, and I was getting picked up from Tom's house, so he came to pick me up. And I was showering, and he was, like, playing on the piano, and as I came out of the shower, he was playing, like, the dun 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 I went and stood next to him at the piano, just in a towel, and we just kind of wrote the whole thing. What I hadn't really experienced before was, during the making of this record, the times, when I felt good and I felt happy, were like the happiest I've ever felt in my life. And the times when I felt sad was yeah. like the lowest I ever felt in my life. And I think it was kind of that feeling of when you can feel yourself kind of falling back into one of those moments where, yeah. where you're there. And the chorus says like, what am I now? Am I someone I don't want around? It was kind of like, I kind of started to feel like threads of you know, where I could see myself becoming someone that I didn't want to be. Mm. And, uh, and that was really hard. But I think that the thing that's nice with that is you get to write a song about it and be like, okay, next, you know. My fa like, I'm so lucky with my family. They've always just been really supportive. And that's kind of, it's kind of all you can ask for with with like doing this is obviously, you know, sometimes you don't want to go home and be like, I'm miserable right now. And that happens too, but also have the relationship with my family where if I need to have that conversation, I can. The thing with my mum is she's less of like a, she's less of like a sound bite of advice. She's more, she's like the kindest woman I know, you know, so. For me, it's always been like just watching her, how she is with people and, and stuff is like, she just, I just don't think she has like a bad bone, which is an incredible thing to grow up around. To have that person like supporting you is, um, it's amazing, she's the best. She's like actually the best, so. Friendships are probably just the most important thing to me. Like the people I'm really close with are just, I'd say, way more important to me than anything else. I've definitely felt a difference in the conversations that I have with friends. I guess since you like experience death more. When you're a kid and you lose a grandparent or something. Yeah. And it's really sad, but also it's like, oh, grandparents are the people who die first. You know, I think you have those, those moments where, and every single person does it who's ever lost a friend, where, you know, whether you're close to them or not, I think everyone has that thing of like, I wish I'd just asked one more time if they were okay, you know? And if there's any positive thing that could possibly come out of that, it's that, now, the conversations that I have with friends about that stuff is, is way different in terms of like, you know, you ask a friend if they're okay and it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm good. And you're like, I'm like more prepared to have that like, no, but, you know. And that's like 
their conversations that I have with my friends now. And I think that's like a really important thing. And that obviously, like I said earlier, is where like real friendship comes from. And I don't think everyone's lucky enough to have it and I don't think it happens all the time. So it's also definitely changed over the last few years. But when I first came here, it was like, oh, if you get to move here, it means you've made it. Like, you did good. You know, you get this like, it's everywhere you've seen in movies and you're yeah. kind of like, oh, it's amazing. Like, you're in the mix and you get to be here. And I think the more time I spent here, I was like, oh no, actually, if you can come here and then leave. The thing with here is like, I've never felt at home here in LA, which is, you know, in one sense, not great, but at the same time, I always feel like I'm on holiday. I really enjoy being here. A lot of my closest friends are here, which is where I usually feel the best is when I can see those people. London's like just where I'll want to be at some point. And it's a weird one because after traveling so much, I don't think, I don't look at the future as like, I'm going to live in this one place and then I'll never move anywhere. And, and I think part of the thing with like the mushrooms thing for me is that I never do anything when I'm working. And I don't even drink when I'm working. If I'm touring or anything, I don't drink really at all. And when I was in the band, it was like, to me, it felt like it was so much bigger than any of us. So I was like, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. Making this record felt like, I just felt so much, like, so much more joyous. And I was with my friends. It was like, I want to take some mushrooms. I'm going to take some, like, now's the time to have fun. Like, we're in Malibu. And if you're taking anything to, like, have fun and be creative, then great. And I was with my friends and making an album you obviously get so in your head and you get so like self-conscious about everything and you hit these bumps in the road where you're kind of thinking, is this good enough and is it this enough, is it that enough? There's like an afterflow of some of that stuff where sometimes you take something and then for 10 days after you're like, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be fine. I'm just trying to go through life being a little less worried about stuff. Definitely with like working, because ultimately, it'll be okay. It's like, if you don't hit the top of the chart, your life doesn't change. Like, I think realizing that it's like, if that was what I was aiming at, and then it didn't happen, then I'd feel so much worse. Mm. But redefining it for me has been amazing to be like, oh, but I'm, that's not the game I'm playing. Especially with that stuff, because Casey, I just love her. Her coming on tour was, I was more thinking of like, who do I want to watch every night for like 30 shows? I'll be doing something, sure, <laughs> probably. It, it's my favorite part. Um, I mean, I've completely fallen in love with being in the studio now because of like the freedom that comes with it. And I think also now I'm kind of learning a different way of doing it. I think I'd get like chunks in the studio. I'd book like a studio for two months and then I'd go and I'd be in there every day because I felt like I'd kind of be like, well, we've booked it, so we have to be in there. And I think at some point, You've written everything that you have to write in the moment. And you realize you're not actually living because you've just been in the studio for three months. So I'm kind of tr working out still the balance of like, next time maybe I'll go in the studio for a couple weeks at a time while continuing to just kind of live. 
you know, if you if you get to make stuff that you're passionate about and you get to make something that makes you happy, if you're happy doing what you're doing, then nobody can tell you you're not successful. Thank you, Princess.